Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this month's lecture. Today's speaker is Dr. Linwood Hammers, and he will be presenting on peripheral vascular disease. Mary, can I begin? Yes. Mary, the uh, information up in the right uh, corner, it's blocking my visualization. Can I get rid of that? Uh, yes, there should be um, an orange arrow where you can minimize it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let me begin. Uh, my name is Linwood Hammers. I think I've lectured to uh, our residents and fellows in the past. Um, if you see with my name down there is John Pellerito. Uh, John was a fellow of mine probably 25 years ago, and both he and I became very interested in peripheral arterial disease and also carotid disease. John has since uh, gone on to become one of the major uh, writers uh, of peripheral vascular disease and has written books with Bill Zweibel, who uh, was one of the early pioneers in this area. So we're going to take a look at lower extremity peripheral arterial disease. Now you see two pictures. One on the left, you see a low impedance system, and on the right you see a high impedance system. The high impedance system on the right is that of a peripheral arterial uh, evaluation. That is a normal waveform for a peripheral artery. The one on the left is for a carotid artery. Now, each of the end organs is very different. The uh, carotid artery is feeding the brain, and a similar pattern of low impedance is, is going to be within any organ, liver, kidneys, pancreas. Whereas the waveform on the right, as I said, is going to be feeding muscles. Now, with this high impedance system, um, this can change. Whereas the brain, the other organs, they essentially want similar flow throughout. With the lower extremities, you have the fright or flight capabilities where that waveform can change. However, just remember, this is a normal waveform, and we're going to look at waveforms throughout to identify uh, the presence of disease. Now, this is a highly prevalent disease. It affects almost 12 million people in the U.S. every year. Uh, it's associated with a significant morbidity and mortality. Patient awareness, and I'll say physician awareness of this, is often quite low. Now, there's a broad range of symptoms. The most common is going to be claudication. Uh, however, there are other symptoms from uh, cold feet, uh, tingling, etc. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about ABIs, but let me just mention an ABI that is less than 0.78 is associated with about a 30% chance of a five-year risk of MI stroke and or vascular death. Vascular disease does not affect one area, just the carotids or the coronaries. It affects typically all the vessels throughout the body. Now, the diagnostic test, we're going to be talking about ultrasound, but an indirect test is the ankle brachial index. Uh, other ways of looking at the uh, vessels are MRA, CTA, and arteriography. Now, I think this is a good point to mention. Every lab is going to utilize these to different degrees. So what I'm going to do is explain what we utilize in my office, and uh, you may find in your setting that uh, people will use other modalities with less emphasis on ultrasound. Some people will use more emphasis on ultrasound. So whenever you go out to whatever jobs you'll be taking in the future, you will uh, have certain training and you will accommodate based on what the training is there. Now arteriography is still considered the gold standard. It is, however, invasive. There's exposure to contrast and it's limited for serial examinations. It does, however, have excellent anatomic displays, and when arteriography it does, is performed, it does allow therapeutic stent placement or even angioplasty. Now, non-invasive tests would be ideal. Even though you're going to use art, and angiography as the gold standard, you want a desirable alternative. This, however, has to detect the presence and location of disease, you must be able to distinguish severe from non-interventional lesions, and you have to be able to evaluate any procedures that are done, such as angioplasty, bypass grafts, or stents. And the other thing is, obviously, if there is some procedure or if there is known disease, you'll be able to do, perform serial studies. 
Now, when there's a 50% diameter reduction in the peripheral arteries, that causes a problem, resulting in decreased blood pressure and blood flow. We know in the carotid arteries, we will use a 50% diameter reduction as a significant stenosis, but in terms of surgery, et cetera, nothing is done until 70% stenosis. A 50% stenosis has a greater effect in the lower extremity because of, again, the end organ, which is primarily the muscles. Now, ABIs utilize systolic pressure measurements. It can be sensitive. It's easily obtained. And most vascular labs will use this as a screening exam. It can evaluate segmental pressures, pulse volume recordings, Doppler waveforms. It can be utilized with treadmill exercise testing. Now, the ankle brachial index is a ratio of the systolic blood pressure between the ankle and the brachial artery. The normal is going to be between 0.9 and 1.3, meaning that the ankle pressures are typically a little bit higher than the uh, brachial arteries. Over 1.3 is typically a bad sign that there can be calcification so that the vessels are not pulsatile. This is often secondary to diabetes. Between a 0.75 and a 0.9, this is considered mild um, peripheral arterial disease. And often, if there is disease, it may be only one focal area. When you go to a 0.4 to a 0.75, that's considered moderate peripheral arterial disease. And this can be one severe stenosis, or it could be two or more stenoses. Uh, with the ABI less than 0.4, this is considered a severe disease and that can result in limb loss. This is an example from Joe Pollack's book um, of what an ABI is typically going to look like when uh, the information is uh, registered. So we take a look at the top and the middle. Brachial arteries are 175. Uh, we take a look at the pressures as we're going down, right versus left. We can see in the common femoral, superficial femoral, the uh, pressures drop to 115 versus 180, and that pressure continues to be decreased on the left side. The ankle brachial index on the right is 0.98, and on the left, 0.61. So this is consistent with disease that at least is beginning at the uh, most common area, the uh, femoral artery. Now, there are limitations of the ABI. As we said before, arterial calcification, diabetes, can affect the results. With the ABI, you cannot lo precisely localize disease. It doesn't determine the number of lesions, and you're unable to discriminate stenosis from an occlusion with the extensive collateral vessels. So Doppler imaging protocols have been developed. You know, the indirect tests, as I said, are useful for screening and demonstrate the level of disease. The sound can be used as a screen with evaluation of the aorta to the entirety of the lower extremity, or it can be used as a focus study of the level or segment of interest. Many people are using the last area now because of the time involved. The lower extremity screening in its entirety is, as I said, to read the vessels. You map the entire lower extremity. It is time consuming. It can be difficult in diabetics. And the question is, is it supplemented by MRA or CTA? Many uh, labs now are using the MRA and CTAs, particularly for the uh, vessels below the knee. And as I said, I don't know what your experience is, but that is becoming more prevalent in our area. Now, the protocol for a focus lower extremity is this. You're going to use color Doppler sweeping of the vessels for narrowing and aliasing. That will give you an idea where to look, and that can be much more rapid. You're going to locate this area of interest by utilizing this. You're then going to use pulse Doppler examples at each arterial segment and at a site of flow disturbance. You're going to utilize grayscale as well, and you're going to measure any significant stenosis length. If you notice, we've got color power, pulse Doppler, and grayscale. All three of these should match. And if I have ever lectured to you on the carotid, everything should come together so that when you make a diagnosis of a certain percentage, everything matches together based on your visualization, the Doppler, and the color. Now, the focused Doppler and color flow examination gives physiologic and anatomic information. It can give you the location, length and the degree of stenosis, 
gives selected application of arteriography, angioplasty, and or stent placement, and it can follow proven lesions and evaluate the therapy. Now, as I said, more and more people are using this primarily for above down to the popliteal region, although, again, many people are still using it for the lower extremity, uh, meaning uh, in the calf region. Now, if you know where atherosclerotic disease uh, exists, you can be a little bit more specific in looking for these uh, areas. It typically occurs at bifurcation points. 25% of stenosis is a, involve the aortoiliac region. Now, portions of this can be obscured to us uh, because of bowel gas. The most common is the area that ultrasound is extremely good at which is the FEMPOP region down to the adductor canal, and 10% is in the calf arterial system. The technique is typically with a linear array transducer, and it can range from a 3 to 12 megahertz. Uh, I will utilize a curve, particularly in the pelvis, and if you have a patient who's very large, I also utilize it a lot in the region of the adductor canal. When that dives deep, you may have difficulty and you can push behind the calf and sort of push that vessel up anteriorly to take a look. You want to optimize the grayscale and color Doppler parameters. You will adjust the pulse repetition frequency to detect hemodynamic disturbances. You may need to raise or lower this depending on whether there's too much uh, vibration. And you want to perform pulse Doppler in the regions of the color aliasing. Now this also is from Joe Pollack's uh, book. And now what Joe is shown here is pre-stenosis, there is a normal waveform. There is a systole, diastole with reversal of flow. When we talk about reversal of flow, on imaging with color flow, you're going to see color, no color, color, no color as the beat goes through. However, at the area of stenosis, if you look, there is continual flow similar to a carotid artery. That's because of the pressure differential and the blood flow wants to get through. It's like a dumping syndrome at this point because it's dumping into the lower vessel and you're going to see color flow throughout. So it's continuous color flow as in a carotid artery. So a normal peripheral arterial waveform has a triphasic pattern. There's initial high velocity forward component. You have an early diastolic uh, reversal and a late diastolic forward component. There's usually a narrow systolic window and as we can see right here, this is the window right here. And there's a normal velocity range. We'll get into the velocity ranges that are accepted uh, uh, early on when the people are starting to look at the vessels. So the criteria for classification of the arterial stents includes this. You want to look at the waveform. You want to look at the peak systolic velocity, peak systolic velocity ratio. You want to see that window to see where that fills in. You want to look for color flow aliasing and persistent color. As I said, with uh, triphasic waveform, it should be color, no color. And if you see color throughout, even if your, your eye did not pick up uh, you know, aliasing or imaging the suggesting stenosis, that's an area of stenosis. Image evaluation, I think, is less uh, of a uh, concern uh, compared to the other two. However, again, I will reemphasize this. All of these modal or all of these parameters must correlate. Now there are factors that affect the waveform and peak systolic velocity, and you should be aware of them because when you're going to use information to interpret this stenosis, you have to ask these questions or at least find out from the history. What's the heart function? If somebody's in CHF, they're not going to generate higher velocities uh, throughout the whole body. There can be a valve abnormality. And again, that's going to affect what the pressure of the blood flow coming from the heart is. The vessels can be tortuous, and you want to have an idea of what the branches are, uh, and if any of those could be occluded, et cetera. You also need to know if there's distal resistance. If you're going to examine a patient who has an inflammatory process, there's typically going to be a lot of flow because the end organ is the muscles, and if there's an inflammatory process going on, that's going to have a low impedance flow throughout and may not actually uh, indicate a stenosis. Neuropathy and whether the extremity is cold or warm may affect it, um, depending on whether it came in from the cold, etc. Now, 
early on, parameters were set, and people felt that normal femoral arteries were between 80 and 100 cm per second, popliteal 60 to 80 cm per second, and tibial arteries or the calf vessels 40 to 60 cm per second. So when you look at the peak systolic velocities, people felt that a stenosis less than 50 percent was between 100 to 199 cm per second. However, when the uh, velocities went over 200 cm per second, it was considered a 50 percent, 300 centimeters per second, a 70 or 400 centimeters and 80 percent stenosis. Now remember what I said, some people have a CHF, some people uh, who are athletic are not going to necessarily generate high pressures because they are uh, have a lot of control over their muscles and their heart rate. So a lot of people started looking at peak systolic velocity ratios. So what you do here is you look at the highest peak systolic velocity at the stenosis divided by the peak systolic velocity 2 to 4 centimeters prior to the stenosis. That's what the Pollux image showed us before. Now utilizing this, if there is less than a 2 to 1 ratio, meaning if, a, if you see uh, similar on the prior chart, which I'll go back to, if it's if you, let's say normal is 100, and between 100 and 199, it's less than a 2 to 1 ratio, it would be a less than 50% stenosis. 2 to 1 ratio, 200 centimeters or above, would be a 50% stenosis and onward. However, if there is abnormal uh, or uh, decreased ability of the heart to pump the blood, you can utilize a ratio where a 30 cm per second pre-stenotic and it goes up to 100 would indicate a 3 to 1 ratio, about a 70% stenosis. Many people have adopted this and I utilize this uh, extensively when I uh, evaluate the peripheral arteries. So you go from a 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 4 to 1 uh, ratio indicating the stenosis. Now a 1 to 19 percent diameter reduction shows minimal disease. There's no widening. This is a normal waveform. And you know, uh, 20 to 40 percent, you may start seeing some changes. Uh, on this, it looks like there's some turbulent flow. Uh, so you would expect this is approaching or possibly a mild stenosis. This uh, can show an increase in peak systolic velocity of between 30 and 99 percent, but not essentially a 2 to 1. And the reverse flow component remains present. Between a 50 and 99 percent diameter reduction, there is significant disease. This is loss of the reversal. There's marked spectral broadening, which we see here. There's a 100 percent increase in peak systolic velocity when compared to the uh, area prior to that. I mean, if you take a look at this, this is up to about 300 cm per second. And based on that, uh, the prior just velocities, that would be a 70% uh, stenosis or greater. However, if the velocities beforehand were 50, that would be a 6 to 1 uh, ratio. So we're going to look for color aliasing, the persistence that I talked about before, post turbulence that can occur, and parvus tardis, which we'll comment on and show you what parvus tardis means, which is usually an indication of fairly significant disease within the vessels. Could represent tandem lesions, or a very significant focal lesion. So here is an external uh, iliac artery. So let's take a look on color flow, which is going to allow us to look real quick. We see, see alias and turbulent flow. <clears throat> we then take a uh, velocity proximal to this, and then we see a velocity up to 300 cm per second and a ratio of uh, 50 to 300, a 6 to 1 ratio. Now that's very important, and you look at this and you know that there is a high-grade stenosis there. But what else do you know? If you take a look at this proximal waveform, this is abnormal. It's not triphasic. So what this is indicating is there is disease up above as well. Now as I said, sometimes you're not going to see the common iliac artery because of bowel, but you know that there is disease up above. The fact that this is a waveform that shows no rounding of the waveform or total loss here, you know that it is a significant stenosis, but not one that is very limiting, meaning a 90% stenosis or greater. So always look at that waveform, even though you're using a ratio, there is disease up above. 
So here is another patient we look at. We look at the um, pre-stenotic. This is a more of a normal triphasic waveform. So this is uh, in the superficial canal. So we know that there could be some disease up above, but there is no rate limiting or volume limiting stenosis. Velocity is less than 50, goes up to about 140 or so. Uh, this is a greater than 2 to 1, approaching a 3 to 1 ratio, but 2 and a half. And what you see here is a stenosis of greater than 50%. So again, uh, not every stenosis is going to have a post-turbulence of um, uh, parvus tardis. Here is a patient with a distal superficial femorari. You see that this is an abnormal waveform. The uh, velocity is picked up here in an area of color persistence. And distal to that, there is the parvus tardis abnormality. What happens here is the stenosis is so significant, it is essentially trying to take as much blood as possible, but it's still not able to reproduce or reconnect and contract, um, forming that triphasic waveform. These are typically severe stenoses uh, without any diastolic flow and sort of a rounding pattern here. So occlusions, what do we see in occlusions? Well, there's absence of flow. There's going to be a damp possible proximal and distal waveform because as that blood flow is coming down, if the uh, collaterals are not large enough, the uh, blood flow may bounce back a little bit. Once the vessels get a little bit larger, uh, you may lose that dampening initially, but you still have distal waveform abnormalities. And you're going to look for collateral flow. So here we see a color flow, and the vessel seems to stop right here. Uh, what's going on here is this recanalization. Uh, and here is to show you collateral flow. Now, patients are often asked to walk to increase this collateral flow. However, the collateral flow often does not fulfill its needs. So here, going through the collateral flow, what do we see? We see persistent flow like an end organ uh, structure with continual diastolic flow. Again, because it's dumping. It's dumping into a system that is, is lacking blood flow. So it's almost like a waterfall that wants to get as much blood through there as possible. Now, this is not a large vessel, so the velocities are not very high but there should be other additional collateral vessels forming to hopefully allow the patient to walk and live with some other normal life. Here is a collateral flow. We see the superficial femoral artery here. Here's a large collateral. Here's where the vessel is occluded. And then distally it recannulates. And here we see on the angiogram, it's coming around. It's a fairly large vessel. Recannulates below where the uh, uh, the uh, popliteal uh, artery would uh, uh, go into the calf uh, arteries. And this is just a very good example of that. So studies have been done. Um, I'm going back to some of the original work here. Uh, Kosman in, uh, in the journal of vascular surgery. Now a lot of this original work was done by vascular surgeons. Now a lot of radiologists were involved, such as Bill Zweibel, Joe Pollack, uh, my friend John Pellerito, uh, and they looked at 84 extremities, 50% diameter reduction, sensitivity 87%, specificity 99%, and for an occlusion of 96%. Now this again, you can take a look, it's been many, many years ago, and the technology of the color flow doppler was not as exquisite as it is now. Now, Ranke looked at this, and again, I go very much with Ranke's study. They looked at 62 patients, and they looked at the ratios because they felt that there was a, a better correlation with the uh, ability of the heart to pump blood, and they uh, performed this with angiographic correlation on all these. Now, the ratios here are a little bit different than what we utilize now. Um, 2.4, or as we typically use a 2, and then PVR here of a 4 and 7. Uh, again, every lab is, may have slight variations of this. Now, the color flow findings in peripheral arterial disease, we've talked about it. Focal color change or aliasing, color persistence with high-grade stenosis. And actually, John and I mentioned this uh, many, many years ago, and I think that was the first that was published, this color persistence. 
You can have a color brewing due to perivascular tissue vibration. This is typically seen in a very high grade stenosis because the velocity is going through so fast it's vibrating the tissues and, and unless you adjust your uh, color flow you may obscure detail. And I'll show you an example. And then the color mosaic pattern due to the post stenotic turbulence. So here's a focal color aliasing which we've seen already and you see, you see the turbulent flow and you look at this and you know, imaging wise you see a little bit of plaque here but the degree of stenosis is much greater than the imaging. Okay, and the degree of stenosis can be much greater than the color uh, information. So here is color persistence. So what does that mean? If you look, this is in systole. We see that there's color flow, color flow here, and then diastole really shouldn't see any flow. And we see that there's persistent flow here. Now if you look, there isn't much in the way of turbulence, but this is a significant stenosis, meaning that there is diastolic flow uh, there's color brewing, and you can see that there's this extensive vibratory effect throughout the soft tissue. You just change the color uh, gain, and you can get rid of this vibration so you can see the imaging a little bit better. Now, pulse Doppler findings. We've talked about this, but let's go over it in more detail. Elevated peak systolic velocities, loss of diastolic reversal in stenosis, brewing, and the parvus tardis waveform distal to a very high grade stenosis or tandem lesions. So here is a posterior tibial artery stenosis. You see the color flow pattern of aliasing. You see pre-stenotic and waveform. But what does this tell you? Number one, it's about 35 cms per second, but it's an abnormal waveform. There is superior or uh, there is stenosis of some point uh, higher. It may not be a focal stenosis. It may be a diabetic who just has this uh, extensive disease where the vessels are not uh, uh, compressing as typical. At the area stenosis, the velocities go from 35 to uh, approximately uh, uh, 240 or so cms per second. This is a high-grade stenosis. And then distal, you see this waveform here. Okay. Now we know it's a high-grade stenosis, but it is not affecting it that there is a parvus pardus abnormality. There is an abnormal waveform distal as well as proximal. Distally, you see more of the uh, filling in of this uh, uh, band right in here. Okay. Now, popliteal artery stenosis. Here we see a high velocity, a lot of diastolic component. Here it's only reading about 200 cms per second. So what do we see distal? This is parvus tardis. There is very little blood getting through, and you can see on the angiogram, this is just a small little trickle of blood going through here, and then you see the popliteal artery, which is actually a little bit prominent and perhaps aneurysmally dilated. Now, rest pain is abnormal. That means there's something bad going on. So we take a look. Here's a common femoral artery, 36 cm per second. Well, that's not good, but, you know, is the heart not pumping? But it is an abnormal waveform indicating disease farther on up. We see a little bit farther down, superficial femoral artery. And really, I'm having a hard time seeing the vessel. So is this just a high-grade stenosis, a little trickle of flow going through at about 14 cms per second? And this is really almost a parvus tardis, not quite the rounding. As we go farther on down, we see a femoral artery occlusion and collateral flow. As we continue in the right popliteal artery, we're not really seeing any flow. And then this in the popliteal artery, uh, really not picking up much in the way of a Doppler signal. So an arteriogram was performed, farther and up, a little bit of disease right here. And as we go down, you can see that there is a stenosis, collateral vessels uh, forming. But again, just trickle of blood flow going down through. This is a patient with the possibility of limb loss secondary to uh, uh, severe disease. Now, as I said, tandem lesions are important. If you find one stenosis, it doesn't mean you're done. So let's take a look and see what happens here. Here's a superficial femoral artery in the mid portion. Add a little bit of a triphasic waveform, not totally abnormal, although this is filling in uh, within the waveform. We see distally here a stenosis. Doppler signal goes from about uh, uh, 80 up to uh, 
uh, approximately 300 CMs per second. So it's a two and a half to three times ratio. Below that, there's a parvus tardis, but the velocity is still fairly high, up to about 146 CMs per second. But there's not much blood flow getting through there. We go a little bit farther down. Now it goes from 140 to 550 CMs per second and with a very abnormal waveform and uh, with high velocities. And this is another stenosis of greater than 50%, about a 3 to 1 ratio. Distal to that, posterior tibial artery has a parvus tardis abnormality. So these are tandem lesions. Here's a patient, left external iliac artery. Waveform is abnormal to begin with, so there's disease more superior. Velocity is about 51 cm's per second. And this patient at the external iliac artery goes up to 250. That's a 5 to 1 ratio. We go a little bit further down, and there's another area of stenosis of up to 220 cm's per second with an abnormal waveform. And then we go even further and there's 350 cm's per second. So there are multiple tandem lesions in the upper extremity, or the upper portion of the uh, lower leg. And then when you get to the popliteal artery, this is just showing a trickle of blood going through of less than 15 cm's per second. Now, here I want you to take a look at this. I'll give you 10 seconds to look at it. And the question is, where is the lesion? Is it on the right or is it on the left? So let's start on the right. Is this a normal waveform? Yes, it is. It's a normal triphasic waveform. So we know that at least at this point, we have not come to a stenosis, and there's no stenosis superiorly. When we look at the left common femoral artery, is this a normal waveform? No, it is not. The velocity is quite low, uh, which is another sign that, again, either cardiac problems or there is a more proximal stenosis which is suggested by this waveform here. So this is about 25 cm's per second. We go into the region of the external iliac artery, and again, you know, we utilized a, a curved array transducer looking at this, and we see the stenotic uh, turbulence, and here's a velocity of higher than 450, going up to 500, 600 cm's per second. So the lesion is on the left reflected by increased velocities and a poor signal lower. Now, ultrasound is very good for uh, pseudoaneurysms, whether they be iatrogenic from angiographic procedure, or we'll take a look later on at post stents. Uh, when uh, John and I were doing a lot of these years ago, we would then do compression. Uh, this can be very tiring. Uh, we'd utilize the residents for this. Now people are utilizing the injecting material to shut off the uh, pseudoaneurysm. Uh, but compression can work, and it does work. You just want to make sure that you're compressing the neck. This is an AVF. Again, very easily diagnosed with the ultrasound. You're going down, you look, and you go, wow, this is abnormal. What's going on here? Is there a stenosis here? But then as you change the uh, color power or the, the color uh, frequency, you can see that here's the artery just dumping blood into the vein. Uh, this again is like a waterfall, and this, with a, when you don't change the color pattern, uh, you just get this tremendous vibratory effect. So again, this is from Joe Pollack's book. What you see here is markedly abnormal blood flow to a peripheral artery prior to the AV fistula. Again, most of these are iatrogenic, and once it dumps through here, this is a velocity in the vein, which almost looks like an artery, and then distal as long as the vessel is not damaged or severely atherosclerotic or resuming normal waveform. So this is just an example. Here we take a look. Um, this is the fistula, and here is the dumping into the vein, and here is the waveform in the vein, which has more of a arterial type waveform. Now ultrasound is very good for uh, popliteal artery aneurysms, which occur in a fair number of patients who have aortic aneurysm. They should be looked for anytime you're looking at the aorta. Take a look into the uh, popliteal arteries, uh, which should be uh, really less than about a centimeter and a half in size. And with the color flow, you can actually measure out the lumen. Interoperatively, we are utilized quite a bit. Uh, you're going to take a look before 
somebody is closed up, you're going to see if there is any residual tissue. Uh, is there a possibility this could uh, uh, continue and then form an occlusion uh, or severe stenosis of the graft or post-surgery? Arterial grafts we look at. This is the normal waveform up above. Here is the graft. And with these sharp angulations, just be aware that you know the little turbulence you see there does not necessarily mean stenosis. However, as you go down, you see that the velocities increase tremendously, the 350 cm's per second. And then the arteriogram is just showing this little trickle of blood flow that is going through into the lower extremity. So post-graft, the patient had severe pain, and ultrasound could make the diagnosis. Here's a graph. Significant pain, no pulses, there was an occluded graph. Now, in situ, graphs uh, can present with complications. And you see one here. Here is a uh, perforator. Here is the uh, waveform going through this. And what you see here is when they tied off the veins in this in situ graph, they did not get these uh, connector veins here, small veins which then went to another venous system and essentially formed an AV fistula. These would have to be tied off uh, or this uh, would drain the blood without the blood going distally with adequate pressure. Now graft stenosis can occur within the mid portion or uh, in any part of the graft. Typically it's going to occur at the proximal or the distal portion. And again, we can see that the velocities are extremely high and again, very, very narrow. Now, I like to utilize color power. Uh, sometimes you take a look, particularly when there's something deep. Uh, this was actually in a, uh, a lower extremity, uh, not within the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the pelvic region, yeah, but the patient was big. So I used a curved array transducer, color imaging. Yeah, we saw a little persistence, but we couldn't see it very well. Look at the color power. You can see without a doubt that the, right here is a stenosis. We dealt for that uh, 600 cm's per second. And then with the uh, post, you can see that there's the parvus tardis. And here's this little trickle of blood that is going through here. Graphs can have uh, aneurysms, as identified here. So uh, in conclusion, we can have indirect arterial tests, which is primarily the ABI. Duplex and color Doppler is utilized in our area quite extensively, particularly for the upper portion of the lower extremity. It's a screen for arterial exam. Uh, we can characterize focal lesions. We can monitor disease progression. We can assess therapeutic response. And we can take a look at graft and stent surveillance. Now, as I said, this is the conclusion. But I'm going to show a couple cases uh, for you to sort of test yourself as we're going through. Uh, so let me show four or five of these before we conclude. So here's a patient that comes in, common femoral artery. And I think at this point, all of you can take a look. OK, that's an abnormal waveform. There is something going on more proximal. And we see the velocity of 42 cm's per second. Distally in the common femoral artery, the velocity goes up to 275 cm's per second. That's a 6 to 1 or greater ratio. This is a very high rate stenosis. A little bit further on, going down into the popliteal, you can see extensive calcification. This is a vessel that's not going to contract or move with pulsations. Uh, probably a diabetic patient. And then distally, harvest tardis abnormality. This is a significant stenosis uh, with an ABI probably uh, between 0.4 and 0.75, or it could be 0.4 or less. Another patient. So we see the vessel coming down here. We see at this turbulent flow, we see a very high velocity. And then we take a look at the color power with the curved transducer. This is, in fact, a collateral vessel because this is occluded in the superficial femoral artery in the mid portion. Now, what's important about this is don't become uh, misled by saying, oh, this is a good sized vessel. That's just the vessel, and it's not a collateral. Here's where the vessel would be traveling. And if you use the uh, regular grayscale imaging, 
you'll often or should be able to see that the vessel is somewhat more hypoechoic uh, unless it's a long term uh, or it's been existing for a long time it may be calcified within. Now let's take a look at another patient. We've been showing some fairly significant disease. So let's take a look at the color. Okay, normal appearance, normal waveform. Okay, 73 cm's per second. Distally, we see a little turbulent flow, but the waveform still looks pretty good. Uh, but it goes up to 170 cm's per second. Okay, so there is a triphasic waveform, but it is filled in here, and it more than doubles. This is a significant stenosis. Now, what are we looking at? I hate to say it, but a lot of times we don't get much history from the patients or from the docs. And if you look on the imaging, this is a stent that had been placed. So this is a proximal stent stenosis with not much of a change in the waveform, but the patient was symptomatic and the ABI was starting to show changes and there's a greater than 50% stenosis. How about this patient? On the left, we see it says left popliteal artery proximally with a waveform, somewhat of a triphasic, velocity of, of only about 19 cm's per second, which is pretty low for a popliteal artery. We go a little bit farther in the popliteal artery, and we see that the waveform has changed and the velocities have increased significantly up to about 180 cm's per second. I'm sorry, when I said the velocity approximately, the proximal velocity is about 30 cm's per second not 19. That's, so that was the color range here. So this has gone from 30 to approximately 180 and that is indicating a very significant stenosis. Now this I think is our last image and there can be bilateral occlusions and here's what we're seeing a patient who came in. Bilateral occlusions of the superficial femoral arteries. This is the bifurcation and the profunda arteries in a sense provided fairly significant flow. This patient uh, utilized this to a great extent and even though they did have disease problems, so they were functioning fairly well with this little uh, arterial uh, flow um, without significant EBIs. So I think this is the last image. Uh, Mary, if you're still there, if there's any questions, uh, if we can hear anybody, I'll, I'll listen. Um, there was one question that came in, um, and it says, can you review the PSV in correlation to degree of stenosis? Sure, I'll go back to that peak systolic velocity. Okay. Some people use the peak systolic velocities, absolute velocities. As I said, I think in many people this is inadequate. It's misinforming because you may have a significant stenosis without a um, high velocity. So if you use quote what is standard and what was originally put out, a velocity, you know, they say normally femoral artery is up to 100 cm per second and if it almost doubles to 199, that's still less than a 50% stenosis. A 50% or greater stenosis would be up to 200 or greater. When it goes above 300 would be a 3 to 1 ratio or 70% stenosis and a uh, 400 uh, centimeters per second would be an 80% stenosis. Um, as I said, I utilize more of the ratios because I think this is more uh, adequate. It's the only way you're going to look at tandem lesions because the velocities can drop after a stenosis and if you just use absolute values, you're going to see turbulent flow, but the velocities are 100. Uh, and you're going to say, well, that's not a stenosis, where in fact it started before pre-stenotic, it was 30 cm's per second. So I utilize the ratios I think are overall uh, have been more satisfying to me in terms of my evaluation. Anything else? I don't see any other questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and I hope this uh, has informed people and uh, 
as I said, you utilize uh, whatever criteria at your own lab and become more comfortable with CTA and MRA uh, in addition to the ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just as a quick reminder for everyone, um, next week we will be having our additional lecture by Dr. Rubel. Um, so that will be next Wednesday the 1st. Thank you again, Dr. Hammers. Goodbye.